our share of trouble Hi, here, Sandy. too. Hi, oh, Sandy. okay. Hi, Sandy. Hi. We're going to do we're going to do this today. Did you get this in the email? I did. Yes. The collage. Uh huh. Took some time to really think of who were really good topics in the whole range. You got the whole range. You remember, you remember Daisy Fritz and the poor farm and all that? No. Not that you were there, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that, that wasn't familiar to me. Of course, Dan Dandridge and, and Martin Delaney were, but, but not well, listen, the poor farm. I, listen, Dansky is my favorite. This is Dansky's family. See? That's Henry <laughs> Bettinger with a beard. Uh -huh. That's it. That's her mother, Carrie. The little girl is Dansky around 1860. And the woman with the glasses is Mary Bettinger Mitchell, who wrote, uh, you know, uh, about Shepherdstown during the Battle of Antietam. She's the lower, you know, that's just her sister. Every, what I'm going to say is every Bettinger could write. It could all write. Well, I think we're getting near lunch time. Jim, we actually have these handouts from the previous classes. Oh, okay. Hundred years ago. Yeah. <laughs> you handed those. My, my joke is they are in every tack room and garden shed. <laughs> you were the first class Oliver took with lifelong learning. Do you remember it at all? The first um, the uh, the first day that everybody moved in the center. Okay, we're getting close to starting. Okay. Um, okay. We're, we're going to start in about a minute. I feel like the producer, you know, beep, 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 beep. It wouldn't be uh, talking. Hmm? The producer would not be talking. <laughs> right. <laughs> What's it, video? Yeah. All right, it's nine o'clock. Did everybody have a good weekend? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Breezy, but it was a good night. It was, everybody seemed to be very forward looking. Uh, I thought about what we're going to do in the last two classes after this one. We're gonna go deep on just two people next time because they're the most impactful. James Rumsey and John Hall. And if you got it, if you know the whole story, James Rumsey put aside the steamboat. He was, he is the father of steam turbine technology that is used all over the world. So, but we're going to do a deep dive on him. It's more interesting. And then John Hall is pretty much more than anyone, the instigator of what's called the American system of manufacturing, which is all pivots on making truly interchangeable parts of any product. So I thought I've done a lot of work on them. So I think we're gonna do two people in depth. And then the, the last day is kind of fast. You know, it's like, what's he gonna do? I'm gonna do, a, I'm gonna do something about, I'm gonna tell you something about the constitutional convention and no, I don't know, it's like the human politics of the Constitutional Convention. And the reason I'm doing that is because there comes a time when you're at the Virginia Ratification Convention and everything's pivoting on Virginia approving the Constitution. How many of you know that it only passed 89 to 79 in Virginia? That close. The whole bottom line is it was a man from here who saved it all the West Virginia votes, except one, pushed it over the top. So that's, a, that's the big game changer person. And I can't help but closing off with Patsy Klein. <laughs> I couldn't resist doing the Constitutional Convention of Patsy Klein side by side. Okay. <clears throat> I'm gonna get, I'm gonna be quick on this, but before we get right into, into the women, this is, uh, Martin Delaney is, without a doubt, the most 
accomplished person from Jeff Board in Jefferson County. Just, you know, we, why he's been never heard of is partly because Frederick Douglass made darn sure he, he fought, fought a, he, you know, Frederick Douglass had a legacy machine going. And uh, even though Martin Delaney was co-editor of the North Star with, with uh, Frederick Douglass, if you name search Martin Delaney and all of Frederick Douglass's papers, he doesn't exist. So there's a human thing there. When Martin Delaney's, I'll, be, I'll try to do two minutes. Born May 6th, 1812, Charlestown, freed family. They had to flee because the kids learned how to read and write from a book called the New York Speller, a New York Primer of Spelling and Reading, and they learned how to read. And then they started writing bogus, scrawled, <coughs> free passes to people who were enslaved until the sheriffs found some of the passes. They had to get up, they had to go to, they had to flee to Martins to Pennsylvania. From there, he becomes a cupper and leecher for a doctor in Pittsburgh. Then he grows into a community leader in Pittsburgh. He organizes temperance society, extremely powerful, effective leader, starts his own newspaper, partners with uh, Frederick Douglass on the, on the North Star, gets doctors recommending for Harvard Medical School. He goes to Harvard Medical School. I'm just gonna run through this. And then he and four had to leave before they got their degrees because the students didn't want them there. He needs his own scientific expedition to Africa and writes a book about it. That's what this graphic is about. And then besides all of that, he wrote several books. One was about the travels of a traveling black insurrectionist. It's really profound, an insurrectionist. <coughs> uh, but above all, he meets Lincoln in February, 1865 in the White House. And when Lincoln is finished, uh, Lincoln didn't have a very comfortable meeting with Frederick Douglass. Because Frederick Douglass kind of, they just didn't click. He wrote, Lincoln's wrote uh, his Secretary of War Stanton after meeting the lady, <clears throat> do not fail to have an interview with this most extraordinary and intelligent black man. And he made him major, the highest ranking, uh, person of color in the U.S. Army. A lot more story there, but everything, what I like about him too, without going into detail, he's a good man. He had a family. He stayed married to one woman his whole life, you know, all that. A good man. I call him a good teetotaling Methodist with, a, with an African backbeat. And I must tell you, I'm going to kind of rat out Frederick Douglass. If you, of course, he's a great writer. Of course, he was essential to history. But when you kind of read, you go, wait a minute. What kind of person writes three autobiographies? <laughs> and what sort of man who's highly, highly articulate and his words are his whole life chooses as his life helpmate a woman who cannot read or write? There's a certain attitude about women in that, not to mention the German mistress. See, what I mean is Martin Delaney, I like for certain, because he's just a good, solid person. Look at me. Look at me griping on Douglas, but you didn't know it. He was also president of the Freedmen's Bank while almost all of it was stolen. No, Congress had no regulations on it, life savings. And they put Frederick Douglass on top, who didn't have any administrative skills, really. He's a writer. And uh, the Congress just siphoned the money off and for projects for their for buddies, but read it up. It's a great untold important story about the, you see, you don't hear about it because there's these narratives and you don't like, people don't want to hear about the Northern people doing the wrong thing. Okay, all that aside, let's put that all aside. This is one great set of what I like to call high-toned women. The first one is Suki Richardson. This is for people at home. Suki Richardson is, is here. Took some research to, to nail it down. I, I was able to locate her with, I won't go into the details, but I was able, out uh, of great luck, I scanned the um, um, census in 1870 around Middleway, and I knew her name was Suki. 
Thank God there was a Suki Richardson who was black. Okay, here we go. This is the story of Suki Richardson. It's short, poignant. <clears throat> One day in about 1855, Suki Richardson, who was enslaved by Captain John F. Smith in Middleway, told her 12-year-old daughter, Daphne, to follow Smith's bid that she go to the town pump a short walk away on Queen Street for water. The story goes in Robert Bates' two-volume history of Smithfield that he wanted, he wanted Daphne for, to be disappeared with a slaver taken away and, quote, shuffle her south. And in this way, neighbors would not know his hand in it. As soon as Daphne vanished, Suki, enshrouded in bottomless grief, began wearing on her head, indoors and out, a bonnet so vast, you've seen them if you look them up, so vast and walled that it became her solitude, <coughs> her grieving place, unbothered, for none dared. A slab bonnet is what it's called, S-L-A-B. Maybe Suki's prayers reached Daphne. Years passed, not a word from Daphne, and Suki, now 82, here, uh, took a formal uh, photo portrait in Martinsburg taken by a photographer by the name of Smith, probably maybe related to Captain Smith. Person number one. If you know Shepherd sat at all, there's nobody, nobody like Miss Violet and Miss Nina. Okay. Serena K. Dandridge. She's, okay, uh, here we go. Okay, this is Miss, do you see the one in the middle with the two split images? On the right was her in her heyday. She was a good artist, but she was highly <laughs> praised for being able to do all the drawings for the Smithsonian Zool <laughs> Zoology Department for publication, all these different species of fish. You know, all the scales and uh, and she, and she did wonderful watercolor. She's a good artist. That's that's her in the fancy professional look. And this is the the one in the flannel is the is the woman that that Shepherd Sound love, no, remembers and loves. Here we go. Serena K. Serena K. Gandridge, Miss Violet to you, or to family and her besties, Pie. Her nickname was Pie. Nobody knows no must like Pie. Yet she almost daily strode into the post office in her jodfers with a big smile and said, ain't you glad you're living? <laughs> she always did that. And then, and then another day, she's kicking the dirt and spitting, spitting on the ground with men saying, well, I was lying down with George Washington. Uh, excuse me, that's the name of one of my sheep. <laughs> I named them after the presidents. Big smile. She said, I have, a, I have a book of poems, in fact, called Sheep I Have Known. So this is a little, little slightly off color, but it's funny. Once a farmer had such an easy banter and thinking by with her cap and trousers, large size level horse, he thought nothing <clears throat> of taking a leak there on the ground without turning around and seeing he assumed she was like him, Vi didn't care. She loved nature. She wrote, making hay is intensely exciting. The horse's beloved wild things are old, 19 years old, uh, uh, 19, 19 years older, 19 years old at least, still untamed with glorious working spirit and beautiful in the proud ways they throw their strong legs and arch their necks. The old shepherd is a fine mower, but his eyes are dim. She's writing about making hay with the ball team, 1947. Making hay with the ball team. The old shepherd is a fine mower, but his eyes are dim, so the job devolves on me. He hitches up the horses after we catch them, appealing often in vain to their better natures to come in and submit to the harnesses. 
It's difficult to describe the beauty of the purple blooming alfalfa with its daisies and tall flowering weeds as it goes down so irreversibly before the night. The orderly rows are behind me and to my left. At the right and in front, the beauty stretches ready to fall, drink up the sun's light and heat, and take on its use as food for horses and sheep. This is me. Now having a big loving heart, the death of her mother in 1914, that's Dansky Dandridge, Caroline Dansky Dandridge, preceded by the deaths of her younger sister and brother. And you know, we develop our character by our ability to react to hardship. That's where all our character comes from, you know? And we all know that. So not only does he have goes through this, but who who's there to, who's there to help them? She has a charming but ineffectual father who grew up on a farm with 69 enslaved persons. So he didn't have a lot to work, work on. And who spent his days. This is his. Does that look familiar? That's King Street. Yeah, in this little house over here, this is his, this is his business. It's called the A.S. Dandridge Farm Implement Shop, which meant A.S. Dandridge, remember, he's not a big ambitious guy. He spent most of the day in his little shop playing muggets, a dominoes, game of dominoes, while poor Dansky, his, his wife, uh, paid the bills by writing poems that she used to buy the seeds for her garden. So the point is, he, he was not capable, he wasn't capable of really helping them personally. So with all of this, Violet coped with her, her word is nervousness, uh, by focusing entirely on sources of joy and peace. And this, you know, I think you're going to see some of this with Dansky. And Dansky, both of them were, Dansky was incredibly productive. It's a way of coping. And like her mother, a great artist and historian and lover of her garden, Violet rose each day for at least 20 years in later years with African-American Jake Monroe. They would, they would milk the cows and get 50 bottles of fresh milk that they delivered in their wagon to some 50 poor families around Shepherdstown. She did, she did the stuff. Violet loved it. I mean, I mean, ain't you glad you live it? Or the, or the kids she sponsored to come out from the city as part of the Fresh Air Fund. Okay. So, Miss Fyle was born at her father's birthplace to Bauer on Eupekin in 1876. In 1896, Violet studied art in Washington, D.C., and was soon discovered by Mary Jane Rathburn and Austin Hobart Clark scientists at the zoology department in the Smithsonian uh, who found that she was quite good at the exacting craft of painting exactly accurate species of fish and other sea life for publication. She was a, a, a heavy producer and loved <coughs> taking field trips, loving the intense detailed work. And in the winter time, she would come, she would be back at her home at Rosebreak in Shepherdstown on 480. It's just that Rose Break is just after the junior high and it's on the left hand or east side of the road with a long lane leading up to it. There was a time when they had, the, there was no grass, but they had four colors of, of, uh, of flocks, <laughs> red, white, and blue flocks. See, hints of eccentricity. Anyway, she would leave her home at Rose Break, take a short trip, back to the bower to go to her little shack along the Opekin alone for peace, to write and to paint in watercolors. She was good. Now her cousin, Nina Mitchell. Okay. These, this is the famous pair. You see that? I think you can tell a little crack clack. Contrasts and personalities. That's Miss Nina. 
and on the in, in the in the, in the uh, okay, what's going on here? Okay, and and that's that's a uh, violet with her buckskin jacket and everything else. I think you get the idea. In any case, Miss Nina was doing the grand tour in 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 Europe. She had money because the family <laughs> owned the land that the LaGuardia Airport rented for years and years and years. But long and short, she's doing the grand tour and Nina, Miss Nina, once wrote Violet that she had gone to the Jeu de Pomme the gallery in Paris and that they accepted one of Miss Violet's watercolor paintings. And she sent a cable, this is what this says. Miss Nina sent a cable back to Violet. She says, Violet, the cow is in the Louvre. <laughs> you gotta love these people. Uh, quick, quick, we wanna stay on Violet, but they're on a class by themselves. We're, Miss, we're staying with Violet, but I gotta say this. Miss Nina had a friend, at Miss Macy, like the Macy stores in Venice, tragically fell in the Grand Canal and drowned. Well, Miss Nina paid for swimming lessons for the gondoliers, no kidding. And if you've ever been to the Boston Public Library, there's a marvelous stone facade. Miss Nina got some great Italian uh, stonemasons and she said, I want you to make a reduced replica of the facade of the Ducal Palace in Venice. And that is now on, on at the Boston Public Library. This is, they're great. I mean, they do things with such uh, class, you know, it's funny. Okay, back to our dear, dear Miss Violet. But you know, she's very sensitive and there were disappointments. Like when she drew all the illustrations for Austin Hobart Clark's monograph on the existing Crinoids in 1915, and the word search of the volume shows that Clark did not credit Violet for her work. Violet would become feel very nervous for things like this. The worst of all years, 1914, when her incredibly gifted, brave mother, mostly unsupported by her husband, uh, died. Well, while her mother was still alive and having trouble, Violet was worrying in Washington about her mother's health. Her parents checked Violet in to the Enoch Pratt Hospital. And, and she wrote, Miss Violet wrote this, here's, here's what she, she wrote, she told the uh, superintendent, I wish to die on account of man's injustice to women. I wish to die on account of man's injustice to women. She was a real suffragette, by the way. And she's also the same person, that same troubled year, goes into the certain city jail where women from a certain district who were prostitutes, uh, and they're trying, to, they're trying to foster a home, trying to get them distributed out of the city. She goes in on her own and offers $25 in clothing each one of these women to sort of incentivize them to change their lives and go somewhere else, all by herself. But she got arrested. Just notice the spirit there. She got arrested because when the police approached her, she had some kind of straight edge in her, in her like the side here, and she gets shows it in her belt in front of them like this. There's that. There's that. You know, she, she's a fighter, but. She doesn't trust men of authority, but you know, she was not detained. She wrote her parents when this was all happening, she was losing weight. It is not wise from my business point of view to keep me here for more than two weeks. You see, my chief business asset has got to be reliability. They must feel they can trust me and that I have good sense or they won't continue to give me this new and original work. I know you and mother would be the last people to do anything that would interfere with my getting good work, particularly now that I've gotten them up to the point of sending fish out to the museum, out of the museum to me. All right. 
So cousin, Miss Violet Misdemeanor are what we call the gold standard of kindness and free spiritedness and generosity in Shepherdstown. Environmentalist savor the true story, true story. For the 1930s, the Miss Violet Dandridge fought to protect cedars. She climbed up oh. a tall cedar street, cedar tree where the Bavarian Inn is now, slated for destruction. The state scientists said that the source of cedar rust in the state was, was killing the big apple orchards. So, and it was later disproven. But anyway, Violet climbed to the top of the tree and stuck an American flag <laughs> on top and came down only under threat of forceful removal. Okay, now back to making hay in 1947. We'll get back in the field and we're done. <clears throat> this year, my helpers were part of the Shepherdstown Color baseball team. Only once defeated by far, they told me, and then they then took the Washington, and then it took the Washington Warhawks to beat them. While I was driving up in the morning, all seven of us back in the car, we commented on what a fine sound and team of haymakers we were. Shortstop and second base are represented by the Holmes brothers. These are names that are still around. Connie and Bunny. And then there was Oliver Wendell, was not named after the Chief Justice, but his grandfather. What shall I say of the horses? The well-beloved, trebly dear, hurt and grieved at their failure after such effort, after trying so more than hard to do the work of the farm unsun unsatisfactorily. And as I left yesterday, Mac hung his head and see how she relates to animals, hung his head and drooped in a way that hurt my heart. Today he ate corn from my hand, a thing he has seldom done before. And she closes by saying, do our failures draw us nearer to those we love? And Violet died November 7, 1956, at the age of 78. And she is buried on, at the top of Elmwood Cemetery in a beautiful, with all the other family, with a beautiful view of the Blue Ridge. Okay. Martin Delaney and Dansky Dandridge are two of my favorite finds, so to speak. They're both not properly uh, taught. An idle dream, the beginning of a poem she wrote. Mercury, give me your twisted staff and give me your winged shoon, for I shall away like a shooting star to the other side of the moon. That's Dansky. Another person who struggled and used it to create so much. 200 garden articles, it's now a book from your England, from England and America. She was truly a first rate uh, garden expert. Um, she has all the Latin aid figured out and, and my poster, those are all really in her garden. And she wrote, uh, well, we just, let's proceed here. All the Bedingers could write. Dansky Bettinger's grandfather, who we've talked about, Daniel Bettinger, could write. Her father, Henry, could write. Her aunt, Henrietta Bettinger Lee, could write. Oh, could she write? She's the one who had Bedford burned down, her home. And there was a Virginia, a third of the third sibling, who they said was better than either of the other two. Dansky's sister, as you know, Mary Bettinger Mitchell, could write. Their cousin, Daniel Benninger Lucas, could write. His daughter, Virginia Benninger Lucas, could write. But none of these could write as beautifully, magically, diversely, and prodigiously as Dansky. Besides her two acclaimed books of poetry, Rosebreak and Joy and Other Poems, the poet John Greenleaf Whittier included her poem, The Struggle. You see, this is the essence of her life. In his anthology, of the greatest poems of the past 400 years. So, and then her books, of course, are Historic Shepherdstown, genealogist 
The Prisoners of the American Revolution is an invaluable record for genealogists. And the third book is George Michael Bedinger, Kentucky Pioneer. These are the product of that little stepping stool that Dansky had placed, gotten established uh, at, the, at the depth of their backyard <coughs> along the railroad track. And so every day when the train was heading, you know, we had to make some changes, but it would stop for her. <laughs> and because they know she was going to the Library of Congress to do work. Now she's quite remarkable. Now, I'm going to read you two things. I found these at Duke. She, she changed the name of Shepherdstown called the Pima. She wrote this in 1900. When you do stuff on Dansky, all kinds of amazing coincidences occur. It was written in July 1900, about 100 pages, several space. Without any plan, we presented that to the public, what we wrote. July 2000 at the Mech. What's that? A hundred years to the month. Always happens with Dansky. Okay, I'm going to read to you because it is so Dansky and she has that dryness. I'm going to read you two things. It's called Books Are Mediums. And then I'm going to read something called The Society for the Suppression of nuisances. You like her already. <clears throat> when I go out to the hammock in the leisurely afternoon, I debate within myself, what spirit should be my companion? Books are mediums. And by them, we live in communion with the spirits of the absent or the departed. For the garden, I want very choice company. Jeffreys, Thoreau, Burroughs, and among poets, Chaucer, Spencer, Wordsworth are my favorite guests. My test for a book in the summer is, will it do to read under the trees? Almost all good poetry is adapted to out of door reading and all that rings false or hollow, all novels of fashionable life or ignoble ambition are as out of place in, in, in the grave and reverent company of trees as a painted, I love this, right? as a painted and bedizened woman of the world would be. Bedizened, new word, new word for the world. <laughs> as a painted and bedizened woman of the world. History cannot be peacefully read in the hammock because it's too harrowing. The Grove is no fit arena for marchings and countermarching, massacres and bloody victories. I choose my companions very carefully for this, my hour or two of peace after the work of the day is over. I do not want any book that would jar the quiet harmony of sky and cloud and treetops or disturb the brooding calm of the hills. See, we can see the Blue Ridge. We can see what you saw. <laughs> now, you're her. And you know, in the old days, you know, in the South, you were visited by everybody's uncle and son all summer. And, and nobody thought, even dared say it's time to leave. And she, and, and her husband, like I said, was, he was most proficient at, at, at liking the desserts. He's not completely, not, uh, trust me, why am I not sounding hard on him? Well, in her diary, she says, <clears throat> ready? My husband is a confirmed idler, okay? I'm free. <laughs> But she's struggling. So here it is. But she puts great humor on this. I wish that a society for the suppression of nuisances could be formed in every country neighborhood and it would take stringent measures to suppress the unwelcome guest. In this part of the world, the door of one's home is supposed to be always wide open to all comers. We have to keep up the traditions of our ancestors before the war because the Southern planters were flooded with visitors all summer. She was against slavery, by the way. We too, in spite of changed conditions of things, must observe the sacred laws of hospitality, however inconvenient they may be. But in the North, they're wiser than, than we and do, these things, and do these things better. 
you're invited for a certain number of days and you don't overstay your time. You don't go unless you're asked and, to, and presumably you're not asked unless you were wanted. <laughs> Write that one down. It is far, far otherwise with us if a relation, no matter how distant, or a friend of a friend relation, or a friend of a friend, or a friend of a friend's relations comes within 50 miles of you, you are bound to invite him or her, it must always be her, to your house for an indefinite stay. The cook may be ill or non-existent. The children may all have measles, and you may be half dead yourself. No matter. Nothing matters except that the laws of hospitality may not be infringed. So when your guests, after driving you to the verge or over the verge of nervous prostration, finally wearies of you and proposes to depart in search of a new victim, you must set your, your teeth and urge them to stay as if your future salvation depended on it. It's so easy for husbands to be hospi hospitable. When time is up, he insists upon a longer stay. And so urgently that he will not take no for an answer. He does not have to keep house, nor instruct the cook in the art of dessert making. And when the kitchen's thermometer marks 98 degrees, he's only conscious of an agreeable listener to the stories that his wife got tired of so many years ago and he enjoys eating the desserts. So, the unexpected guest is almost always the unwanted guest. If I could manage it, I would have the secret stair built in the heart of our giant oaks, which should lead to an area, higher area at the top of the summit, at the summit, hidden from all eyes. Into this peaceful nest, I would disappear upon occasion, say just as undesirable carriage wheels are heard approaching the house. And from my airy perch, I would calmly survey the coming and going of the curious, myself unseen, unheard. How cool, how carefree, how bird-like. I would be in my safe seclusion, and I'm afraid I should burst into song for the very glee and thus betray my secret. That's Dansky Dandridge. On Facebook, if you type in Dansky Dandridge, there's a place with, that I put up with all of her poems, about a hundred of her garden articles, videos, and many other things. Dansky means little, little uh, Dane because she was born in Denmark when her father was the ambassador there. She was born in 1854 and she died in 1914. <clears throat> okay. The next person, this is kind of the, the grand dame category. You're going, okay. We're down on the second, second row. She was a friend of mine. I knew her, she was so cool. I'm, I know I know you know who this is, Sandy. Julie Davis Adams. And I met her when she was about 90. And, and, and she said to me, she, she, we got a ritual where I, I visit her at her house. And, 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 and at the end of the day, even that whole generation, when the sun's low, they're ready for a drink. <laughs> and it's you, Ruth Funk has it too. And she'd look at me and she'd say, well, you know what time it is? And she'd look at me and do this. Is it what, vodka, tonic, this much ice? <laughs> this much ice, okay. And, and I, I go get, I can make, I can get ice, I'm good at that. And then I'd have a little glass of Harvey Bristol cream, you know. But she said, how, she said, she, 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 she's 90 years old. She, how old are you? <laughs> and I think I said, 43, she said, oh my. Oh my, you know. I loved her. She was so cool. When she died, they asked me to be the house sitter. Okay. This is Julia Davis Adams, 1900 to 1992. Adapted from the introduction. Now, this will give you a real flavor of growing up here. Everything we can't have anymore, that, that idyllic childhood. 
Okay. But what's neat about it, she had a, she had two families, father's side, the mother's side. They, they were so fantastically different. It's hilarious. Okay. This is from Harvest Collected Works of Julia Davis. Julia Davis was born in Clarksburg, West Virginia, July 23rd, 1900. She was the daughter of the famed sometime candidate for president, John W. Davis. He ran against Harding and didn't win. Her mother, Julia Level, Lavelle Level McDonald from Media Farm. If you're going down, uh, you know, let's see here, about where Country Club Road is and, and 230, there's over here is Media Farm. Okay. So what happens, she's born and then her mother dies three weeks after giving her life. Julia's resemblance to her mother would pain her shy yet brilliant father and burden their relationship for decades. She said, my father was always kindly and often abstracted, but I knew then and I know still that looking at me hurt his heart. Julia's childhood was divided between the summers at Media Farm amid a group of unrepentant individualists and a family quite properly called a clan. McDonald. She remembers as a little girl the visits of John Singleton Mosby. Yes, a partisan from the Civil War, and the house would fill with excitement. She's just a little girl in making mint juleps for this famous man from the Civil War. And I asked her what she remembers. And she says, I just remember two old men sitting on the porch laughing. But this is the interesting part. Both Mosby and her grandfather, though Confederate this and that, firmly denounced the whole uh, maintaining the veterans groups and the lost Southern cause thing. They never went to reunions. They knew the war was over, forget it. And this is my favorite thing that Julia said. You'll find out more about her grandfather, but she's about to go off to college and she's, she's going north uh, and she's going to Wellesley and then she went to Barnard. He sits her down, this is called wisdom. He sits her down and he says, well, Julia, you're that boy, Julia, like we gotta talk. You know, recognizing that she's going north and she has to be prepared when she tells him she's from Virginia. He says this, Julia, I want to prepare you since you're going north, you know, and I want to let you know something. He said, Julia, I do not regret fighting for my state. And I do not regret fighting for those I love, but thank God we didn't win. <laughs> that is perfect. And you do it, you do it for you, but thank God we didn't win. So home in Clarksburg was quiet. That's the other home. Inward, studious, proper. And Julia was taught at home by a stern grandmother. She said, certainly I was not unhappy with the Davises where I received so much love and learned to love deeply. Certainly do not quarrel with having been taught to use my mind, but it was a sol it was solitary in that silent house. This was the grandmother who knew Greek and Latin, who debated politics and philosophy with her lawyer husband, and who fought off, get this, who fought off pleas of her doctor and the preliminary pains of childbirth <coughs> until she finished <laughs> reading a chapter from Gibbons decline and fall of the Roman Empire. <laughs> I'm not done, I'm not done. So that's, I love it. You got the whole story. <clears throat> but for a child, Julia says, media, the other, the clan, meant joy and freedom. Freedom from anxious supervision, from precocity, from loneliness, from all of that, in one way or another, oppressed my spirit. Children were a commonplace on that farm no one hung over me. No one seemed to care what I did. And I love this phrase. I expanded running wild. I loved you. I just loved Julie. She's so cool. But now back to that 
presence of her grandfather. Now, who was this man who, had, who Mosby thought so highly of that Mosby would come and visit? Well, she adds a little description of him. Summers with my raspy voice grandfather, Major Edward A.H. McDonald, an officer in Stewart's Cavalry, <coughs> get this, who took a bullet in the throat shortly before the Confederate surrender at Appomattox. She said, he had kept himself from bleeding to death by sticking his finger in the wound and then endured six weeks of frequent hemorrhages and fractured jaw before the bullet could be removed. This is, this is the old guard, old type. This was a man who ran the farm with the discipline and precision he had shown in the service, except for his treatment of his granddaughter, me, who he was incapable of punishing. <laughs> okay. Now, Julia, uh, you know, in, in, in factually, she began her career as a reporter for the Associated Press in New York City, where she also headed the adoption service of the Children's Aid Society in the early 60s. She was the author of two dozen books, mostly novels, writing as Julia Davis, and she often dealt with the history of her native state and the role the family had played in it. She also published reminiscences of the years she spent in London as the daughter of the United States ambassador to Britain, Port of St. James, the father Davis. And he ran against Harding and lost. That's too bad. We could have gotten rid of Harding. And her play, The Anvil, that she wrote, is a recreation of the trial of John Brown, written as Charlestown's contribution to the Civil War centennial, and it was an off Broadway production in 1962. As far as I could remember, she yeah. said, what was the off Broadway? The, the Anvil. It was called the Anvil. Yeah, I can't understand why she chose that name. As far as I could remember, I always wanted to be a mother. When I found that I was unable to bear children of my own, I nurtured seven of them. She adopted kids from the Civil War in Spain. And I shared my life with <laughs> three husbands. I also wanted to be a writer. And when I took on the responsibility of raising children, I frequently struggled to balance the demands of my craft against those of the youngsters in my care. And her writing blossomed out of a project to translate the work of Saxo Grammaticus while living in Copenhagen. Then she met a man who wrote really good detective stories named Noel Davison Post. And this is what she said. He taught me more in six weeks than I have learned in all the English courses that I had taken at all the colleges. He really knew what he was doing. He would tell me, you need a little more dialogue here. You got to build this up. You got to build that up. And she, she, your, your dialogue is always either in advance of the story or to enlighten people about the characters. It must always have a purpose. It must always move the story. I really learned how much cloth, I love this line, I really learned how much cloth it takes <laughs> to make a pair of pants. And with him in those six weeks, and in her long life, she wrote 21 books, four plays, and innumerable essays on, on poems. And she said, I'm gonna follow this with her description of being at the farm as a girl, but she once said, I always wanted to write novels and raise children, and I've done both. My father once told me, you have a good mind, but your heart is mush. To that, she would count, I would counter, I wish you were alive today because I would say, Father, my heart paid off better than at the head. The head might have paid better, but maybe I should, could have written better if I had no other interest, but I could not have lived better. I couldn't have been happier. You know, we ought to resolve our our, the math, you know, what the equation of our life so it works. I knew her at this time. Two weeks before she died, she said, I'm ready to go. I had lent some very cherished writings that I had to read. So she dies in two weeks. <laughs> and she said, Oh, they're really good, but I'm ready to go. I, you know, okay, so she's at the 20th anniversary, two weeks after I sat with her. In celebrating the uh, 20th anniversary of the Opera House, 
and all the Charlestown people are at the cliffside. And the mayor of, of Charlestown, Doc Master, Julia is 92 years old, and she says, Doc, I want to dance. Okay. And it was Elling, Duke Ellington's take, the A train. You know, man, figure, figure out how to get this working for you. And it was a very hot and muggy day. And then as they're spinning around the floor, Julia said to Doc, you know, Doc, I've danced my life away in Paris, London, Copenhagen, all over Europe. And, then, and so we got out on the floor, Doc said, and I said, gosh, he said, I whirled her around a couple of times. She looked just simply beautiful. She had these blue eyes and white hair and just so, the most beautiful I'd ever seen her in 30 years. The lights glanced off her eyes and she just looked great, just great. We made a couple of more turns and then she said to me, Doc, I, I think I have to sit down. And she, he said, it's fine. We were walking back to her chair, Julia on my arm and she says, thank you, Doc. A second later, let's see, I thought she tripped over the rug on my left, but she kept going down. She died right there in my arms. I picked her up. I took her out to the pool side and I laid her on the carpet. I put my ear to her chest and there was nothing. She told another friend, which is me, I'm finished, I'm ready to go. And she did it with her usual flair. So if you can hear, if the dance, dark, dark, dance to the A train, uh, take the A train starts playing, you've got a choice. It might have special powers. Doing all right? Let's go back. Let's go back to Medium Farm, 1906 to 1912. This is the stuff we never lived and you wish, I wish I lived then. I've never seen anybody that says it so well. This is medium harm, not the, the quiet, lonely place. Summer meant awakening sunshine, the hearing doves and the wind rustle in the oaks. Now listen carefully. We don't have the sensitivity to know from the sound of the wind, what's the species of tree of the leaves that are rustling. I've read other essays of girls, they knew what the wind was, they knew it that well. And she said, trees have separate voices in the wind. Pines sigh like the sea. Maples murmur, I love this. We can't do this anymore. Oaks rustle crisply. Of course, the sun did not always sign, but that is how I remember it. Children come to, come to seven o'clock breakfast without being called because the food was there. Cereal, fruit in the season, we live without oranges, eggs, usually boiled, ham, bold or fried, possibly hash, hot rolls or biscuits or cornbread, coffee, tea, milk, water. There were no dietary regulations. And you know what? Ch children rarely starve when food is available. Freedom. This is a typical day. The basic family number nine and could rise to 24. The mahogany tables could hold 14. And after that, children ate all at the side table. These were not quiet people. You can make compare it to your family. You know? Okay, at the all meals, they joked and laughed a lot. After breakfast, the major and the three sons went to the fields or orchards. You can just visualize this wearing long sleeves and big straw hats against the sun. Male guests joined them, also the tenants from the small frame houses on the place. We was the pronoun we always used, not you or I. If the work was heavy, cooperative efforts would take care of it. Remember, there's not a lot of cash. People aren't cash wealthy. Grandmother ruled, up, ruled the kitchen, uh, produced three hearty and delicious, if seasonal meals a day, when offered help, she would say, you are honorably discharged. I bet somebody had a grandmother like that. You wore a look often seen in mother's 
of large families, now a vanishing breed. A look of tenderness compounded with patience and resignation. Her strongest rebuke was, that's not the way to be happy. Much later, she once told me that she had, this is so moving, that she had come to bread making with tears. Tears had long ago been dried by facing reality. There were no complaints. She greeted, greeted every guest with open arms if related, with charming cordiality if a stranger who good manners so integral a part of her that tragedy, deprivation, or illness could not change them. You can learn a lot just listening to this. So, finishing, my grandmother and grandfather had married shortly after what was called the war. His capital consisted of his uniform and a horse, no money. He did not have a great deal more money in the bank when I knew him. They were lovers anyway. On their 40th anniversary, <laughs> They held hands and sang the sentimental love songs of their youth. They had an education of the heart, freedom, cooperation, love. And now we live in a different age. End of Julie Williams. How about a dance, Doc? I, you know, he doesn't say it. He's the kind of guy that driver dance her too hard. He wouldn't get, he wouldn't understand that she's frail. Yeah, you know, I just got a feeling like, anyway, look at me, look at me. Yeah, talking man, you know, all exists. Okay, the little, we're, at, we're down at the house on the lower level, which is called the Snow Farm, which is also the poor farm. And this is the, this is the, uh, the center of activity of our two sainted ones, which is, this is Daisy Fritz. <clears throat> Daisy Fritz, Fritz, this, you know, I'm starting to feel the, these are people of another time that just their very personas teach us something. I was able to interview her niece, who was a friend of mine. She, her, her niece was in a support group I did with people that were grieving losses, and, and, and my friend lost her husband and a son when they came out at the light at Hall Town, and somebody just didn't see him. Okay. Miss Daisy Fritz, 1878 to 1961, savior of the poor farm, Lee Town. And each one of them were pushing back from, from a difficult moment and they responded by doing good. She was a widow. It's, you can see the path. Okay. Miss Daisy Anna Dunaway Fritz. Obituary began in the local paper, calling her one of Jefferson County's most widely known and best, best known citizens. Since 1927, she took on the poor, old and enfeebled into her home of last resort, the poor farm. Officially, as the superintendent of the county home, she ran it with love and well, well after such homes were replaced by social workers and the foster home system, in the rest of the state. But her weak heart made her step down in 1959, funded by the state and reporting directly to local authorities. Daisy kept the local county commissioners happy and supportive <laughs> with delicious meals and sweets. <laughs> and they met at the poor farm for meetings and they had Thanksgiving dinners there. She's also politically sharp. And here's what I love. You know that this is a Charles Lindbergh quote. When the regular check arrived, and there was an American Eagle on it, when the regular check arrived from the state, someone would drive her to the bank to Charlestown with Daisy waving the check saying, the Eagle has landed. Poor farmers improved from being a place where farmers before the Civil War could rent enslaved, Orphan black children for work. So you have two sets of saints, Daisy for the elderly and mom and pop wheeler who ran the children's haven orphanage for children. 
They both did admirable service up until 1960. This is a personal person I knew. Rena Marshall, now deceased, but then a young girl who played the piano in the tiny chapel at the poor farm told me about the people there. Now, bear with me, okay. Above all is the haunting account of Tilly, a very old black woman who gently com comforted Rena after she explained the reason for her hanging lower lip, which Rena said just hung straight down. You need to know this, Tilly is Matilda. And there's only one black woman in all the census and that all I've ever found is Matilda Thompson. And she, Worked for Bushwood Washington Alexander. I'm not going to say who pulled her lip. Could have, who knows what? And 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 their little. And the interesting thing is, he never married. And when he he died, he left the house to Matilda. You know, I can't figure. It out. And he said, "You can have it unless you get married again. Then you have to sell it." What's going on here? He sure doesn't sound like the guy who pulled her lip. I don't know. Okay. But it's definitely her because the ages match up. That's Toby Johnson. Okay. A hanging lower lip. Tilly, who said she was almost 100, and that's what it showed in the census, told Rena that when once enslaved, an enraged owner would give a grab, pincer iron for picking up wood, and with it violently pulled her lower lip, permanently tearing her lips connective flesh. And then when Rena's crying and upset, she told me this. She goes, there, that child, that was long ago. And there was also a wondrous banjo player that inspired this poem by Rena. Old Bill played the banjo with a dedicated air, though he lived at the alms house. He, his, his heart held not a care. He played for local dances, happy music all night long. And anytime you saw him, you could hear this happy song. I can make a banjo sing, I can make her fly, I can make the banjo ring, but no man makes her cry. Rena wrote, keep your wailing fiddles or your flute for sad romancing, but me, I'll ride my banjo. A banjo's made for dancing. I can make a banjo laugh, I can make her shout three cheers, but I can't make a banjo cry because she ain't got no tears. So, the depression landed some 30 people in the poor farm, including a sometimes socialite from New York City whose fortune had evaporated. <clears throat> Arriving in a steamer with a steamer trunk and trappings of remnant wealth, the woman was crushed inconsolably when she had been told the farm was going to be a hotel. Daisy Fritz embodies the belief of Albert Einstein, who said that all advances the civilization are the results of acts of individual conscience. So here's the following interview with my friend, Grace Fritz Rowland, her brother's daughter, and the youngest of 10 children in a classic farm family. This, you know, Dad and Daisy, I'll just go run with it. Dad and Daisy farm in Lee Town. My mother was, my mother was from Lee Town. They were all there. That's how they know one another. And Fritz farmed mostly out in Lee Town. And the Flemings were all in there, referring to the poor farm, close together. My mother was a Flem Fleming and dad was a Fritz. So Aunt Daisy and him were brother and sister. They went to church together. They were Methodists. They went to a little bitty church, but Daisy only got to go when she got a, when she got a chance if somebody would come there and help her out. She'd go and get her groceries and things like that. They had buggies. They didn't have cars. You see, on my road, Aunt Daisy going, this is like Lee Town Road. Aunt Daisy going to get groceries, little country stores. They didn't have these great big stores to go to. I always had to go to the poor farm when my dad and them went, because we didn't have cars. Our brother usually would take us and we come and get us piled in the car and away we go. I, I'm trying to figure that out. Okay, 
Well, they have cars now, apparently. Probably at days had someone come and get her in two in cars. We didn't have too many highways. All we had was dirt roads. I guess I was five or six years old when I went out there. My sister and I loved to go out there. It was a lot of fun. We liked to help feed the poor people. And she would let us, and she would put our little aprons, the little aprons on us and say, get your aprons on and you can help do this and that. We carried water, I helped her carry the food, take them up the steps for Daisy. She loved that. Having children around, helping her. There wasn't too many children coming in there, but mostly all she had, she, she was like poor men. Mostly all she had poor men and who didn't have no place to go. She used to have a cemetery along the road on the other side. And that's where they had to be buried because they didn't have any money. There's a lot of people buried out there. She wouldn't let us get too close to the people on the count they might get spit of some disease. She'd make us carry their food from the kitchen. And then when, when she would have big people like the mayor, they'd have their conference table there, big, great big old long table. And it would take my whole room up. They'd sit around there and they'd have their papers and she'd serve them tea cake on the side. She made her own ice cream. They loved to go there. Mostly it was the vanilla because everybody loved vanilla. They had all their conferences there and they'd say, Days, can you take us in? They always called her Days. I always called her Aunt Days. My dad, he loved to go out there. He didn't like the fancy doings she did with the upper class people. She wanted to do her, she wanted to do the, her brother the same way. And one day dad said, Daisy, more food, less fanciness. From that time on, she served, she served them just like the poor people. I thought that was real cute. So she, when there were meetings, I helped her many times to roll up the napkins with the silverware in it. See how they had attention to detail, the respect, you know, and lay it down next to their little plates. The state helped her do this, and Daisy loved it. But nobody, nobody wanted to take it over after Daisy got sick. So I think that's why they did away with it. She had nobody to bother her right up till the day she quit. And she didn't live too long after that. She stayed right there at the house. She had a bad heart. And when she had anything to say, she said it right to you. She didn't hold back anything. She had to tell you anything she'd tell you. She wasn't ashamed to ask for something if she needed it, if she needed help with something and, she, and the state had it. She knew it and she got after it. And she got anything she went after. She'd come in town to the courthouse sometime, somewhere to someone in charge at that time. And she'd say to my dad, she called him George. She'd say, when I go after something, George, I usually get it. I've heard her say that many times. She said, I don't stop till I get what I, I till I get what I want to help these people. And they loved her. And the people, we didn't call them by name, she let us call them aunt and uncle. And when she took food into them, she'd have green beans and potatoes. And back in those days, they had a lot of pork. Cook a ham, sliced ham, sweet potatoes, they loved sweet potatoes. I remember that. And she made her own kraut. And she'd go in the cellar and had this big old crock and she'd get it right out there with a big old spoon and bring it into the big pans. They loved that with mashed potatoes. I had that there many times. And cranberry sauce, she loved to make that and cake. As I say, ice cream she used to make. Well, she did a lot on her own. Back in those days, she took her own and made her own flour. Get that. She'd take it to the mills. She kept it up in a great big old green barrel that she kept her flour in. She'd make enough to do, uh, do her from one year to the next. And it wouldn't get weevils because she had it in the barrels and she kept it there. Almost done. You know, <laughs> I want to cut it, but she's talking about food. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna cut this up a little bit. 
I'll read, okay. She made her own bread every morning. Her people that she kept had warm bread every day, made her own butter. I made many a thing of butter, you know, turn it for her. She'd say, okay, Grace baby. That was my nickname to her. My sister Catherine and I and Dorothy couldn't wait to get out there, but Catherine and I was the ones that she'd get around with Daisy. They would get around Daisy. We was, we'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, Jim, two things. So uh, this woman was uh, single, or she was widow. Married? She's a widow. widow. Uh, yeah, I should have said that. And so again, again, example of a person. Did you know that Mother Jones, before she became a famous campaigner, she lost a husband and four children to uh, uh, an epidemic in Chicago, oh, in Memphis. The whole family. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, what do you do with that energy? That's the whole point. All of our lives have that, but, but you find that's where that power comes from, you know? Okay. And then the house is still existing. Yeah. It's out near the- If you drive the down Lee Town Road and here's the county fair, okay. just back it up a little bit to the west and you'll see kind of back, you'll see, you'll see, um, it's still there. But it's, it's owned by the county. It's owned by the county. Solid waste or something? Well, it's go that's well it's it's <laughs> next to it. You can, enter the, you can enter the landfill, I mean area by going down dark lane, the side road. But uh, it's also where the animal shelter is. Okay. Everybody got it, that you can see it from the road. So I'll wind this up here. You got mom, mother mother. To relax, she'd read, and she was a good reader. Daisy loved to read and listen to the radio. And there was, there was no television then. All we kids knew was get out and play. Sound familiar growing up? Yeah, you, know, you can, we can relate to some of this. In the fields and things and the horses. All you could do is play and ride horses. Wow. That's about all we knew. That's what I did. I rode horses at the poor farm. They farmed that land. Daisy's husband. Oh, uh, that wasn't, you know. She, she, I, he was her partner, but she had a, she lost a husband named Dunaway. I know they'd make corn and plant corn. They had cows, milk. They did their mowing and weeding. They kept that farm going for a long time. It was almost self-sufficient. It was a really nice place to go to. Okay. They, uh, it's stories around these old decaying houses. Daisy liked to sing old hymns like the old rugged cross. The song the old people love was Jesus loves me. And they always sing that. And they have their prayers just like we used to do. It was just the same like now. We'd go out and get a preacher, try to have a preacher there every Sunday. And we had one of those hymnals, but it just got lost along the way. That's, that's Daisy Fritz. I could go on, on longer, but I think you got the idea. Do you have any questions so far? Are you getting a sense of their lives? I, I lost my internet connection and I, I missed uh, why Daisy started the poor farm. I, I lost it about the time that you were talking about the wind blowing through the trees and the, and they could distinguish the kinds of trees and then I was gone for a little bit until I got it back. Uh, I will send all of you the transcript. And now, understand that I had to make some little typo insertions, but you will get all of it. Jim, you and, can send the, the link to the video, too. Uh, yes. Um, yes. No, I don't have a video for date for the for, for the poor farm. Well, I mean, this one. one that oh, yes. Right now. Yes, yeah, thank you. I will send you the whole video. That. Thank you. I think I might send you the transcript if you want it. What I'm getting from absorbing these, you know, particularly Julia and Daisy 
And Mom Wheeler, are you getting this? You, you're seeing a whole life, aren't you? The same thing I am, the same rhythms. You know, I mean, all we got, all we knew how to do was ride horses. I mean, geez, what a wonderful life. Um, and then you also see the the root, the rules, the new rules. Uh, Foster homes replace poor farms. Who has seen any of the videos about Mom Wheeler? It's a good, if you, see, I always have to urge people to do this because just looking at her, her, who she is, and there's these wonderful studio pictures that somebody took of these dear children at the children's haven that are on the video. And it's so interesting how these people kind of wash ashore and land in these places that rescue them. You know, that's what it feels like. The woman who played the organ, just very similar to uh, Daisy Fritz Poor Farm, there's a woman who played the organ at Mom Wheeler's who came and was blind. And she was always the, uh, see, I'm glad you saw it. Yeah. There's so many lessons there. And there's a point, there's a point where it's, it's so vivid in the very first video of Mom Wheeler. Uh, they started taking kids in. And they're they're under the Episcopal auspices, Episcopal Church. And they said, Well, look, you can't keep taking everybody in. You, you got it, you got us. What do you, they said, Well, what do you want us to do? And they said, send them back where they came from. You know, unbelievable. Well, as she says in the video. Well, mom, we're not going to have any of that. You know, we're we're going to keep them. And so they went out on their own. <coughs> Helen and mom, Helen C. quote Mom Wheeler. In the early four, now, okay, Children's Haven. Where is it? Uh, if you remember, okay, it's the. You're on the road that's. Uh, Coming from, from Charlestown, that's the, it's like the, um, it's gonna go, it's Bloomer, it used to be where the Bloomery Bridge was. You know, it's, but now there's a, a, a big road. Uh, as you cross the river, it's, it's a big road. But if you, in the old days, if you're going down, you're heading towards the river, and I think, uh, yeah, and there's a, there's a little store, and there's a Cable Town, uh, Cable Town Road here. As you're getting close to the, bridge, there's a little quick turn to the right. And down along there, that is where Children's Haven was. And they, there was the, uh, this is fascinating. They, there, uh, it was, it was like a, a Jewish home, a Jewish resort, a recreation place. And they got the VA relocated a structure that was used to house German prisoners of war. And they somehow got that from the, the VA down to be the main barracks or whatever at Children's Haven. They had 300 kids over the years there. And you had people like Dewey Hanfin, cute boys with every boy had a lasso and a cowboy suit, you know, they're there like that. And and he he showed up with bare, bare feet and frostbite. Yeah. If you were ever to meet some of these people, wow, they will never forget. All right. There was an old joke that mom liked the boys. She, she didn't want all girls. She, she, could, she was so happy that they had, and, she, and then we have a couple of boys. She's funny that way. That served with one of the first two girls on, down here. In the early 40s, Temp, T E M B E, or Pop Wheeler, focused their attention on the homeless, he and mom, and abandoned. Over 300 received care at Children's Haven just west of Bloomer Bridge on the Shenandoah. 
Pop and his young bride, Mom, were home one night when three young girls, and I think it's the ones I showed you, came to the door. They had no place to stay, and their mother didn't want them anymore. They spent the night, and the next day, Pop took the girls to their mother on the premise that the mother could cast, could, could not cast out her own children. There was no resolution, however, and the three young girls were taken into the homes and hearts of the Wheeler household. That was the beginning of Children's Haven. Quickly, the family grew. As other children facing the world alone joined the ranks, the Wheelers always managed to make ends meet. And when the family finally grew too large for the home, an abandoned farm was purchased along the river. Uh, a short time later, oh, let's just insert something. How do you know how the kids perceive this? First off, you, you know, we're going to continue, but I want, you got to remember the kids, kids always have their own view of things, right? The way the kids saw it was, you know, we're not these poor, pitiful kids. When you went to school, if they were like a gang, if somebody picked on a, a, a boy at Children's Haven, or some girl said the wrong thing to a girl at Children's Haven, you're going to answer. <laughs> they took great pride in that. So don't ever think of everybody as a victim, but they said we love the fact that we protected each other at school. Not in a bad way, just, you know. Okay, so they're building the starting the children's haven, and a short time later, with the help of a few men and several children, a barracks used to house prisoners of war at the VA Center near Martinsburg was moved to the property. A, more, uh, a small store, which proved later to be too large and undertaken, was opened. And a year-round rummage sale provided extricate, uh, uh, extra one of the other, other needs. The children at Children's Haven worked, went to school, and had plenty of chores. And each Sunday, the children attended church. If you look at the video, there's this wonderful photograph of the kids at the, at the church on Easter with the little bonnets, you know, and the girl had a little red, a little. Easter egg basket, just so touching. Each Sunday, the children attended church services. This is very interesting. If they had a religious preference or background, Pop Wheeler would see they could worship in that manner. How interesting. Those with no religious background were to become part of Wheeler's own flock, and they came and they went, but no child was forced to stay and no one was ever asked to leave. Children from the poorest families slept, ate, and played beside children from wealthier families as equals, learning respect for each other. In later years, primarily because of poor health and changing social policy, the Wheelers began a more conventional ministry, but the children never forget. I got a call from a stranger once, and he says, "Can I? I'm coming from Oklahoma, and I, I want to meet you in the Perry Room in Charlestown. Don't know him. And this dear man who, who was probably there, he had all this scrapbook of art and everything from being a child there, and he wanted me to take care of it. You know, he trusted me somehow to keep this. And later, you have got all that. But the children never forget the love and care they received at Children's Haven, and they return time and time again to meet and reminisce about their lives, past and present. Pop Wheeler died in 1990. And he was, this is interesting, Pop Wheeler was flown to the graduation of the son of one of those very first young women. Mom stayed home. She never, didn't want to fly. She's, one, she's classic, you know, if God wanted me to fly, <laughs> he would have given me wings. So he eventually lived in, in Ranson. And I'll, she just had so much light when you met her. And I met her in her room, in her, in her subsidized housing, and she showed me the scrapbook and all that. And this is what I love. I heard a few years later before she died, about she was like 95, that she had slipped and fallen, I think I told you, and she <laughs> banged and dislocated her shoulder. Well, mom just kind of just didn't call anybody, you know, just all afternoon lying on the floor. And, and finally, somebody said, Mom, you know, 
what? Why didn't you call somebody? You've been there for hours? She says, oh, yes. I just leaned back and reminisced. That's Mom Wheeler. That's it for today. Any questions? So the Wheeler family was a pretty good sized family. I mean, the Wheeler family is pretty good sized family in the area. Well, we know all kinds of, of, all kinds of Wheeler property. I live on something. Oh, yeah. interesting. You know, our friend Missy Wheeler. Yeah, Missy. She's she's she's, she's related. She's a yeah. grandmother. Yeah. I thought so. I thought so. Okay. I thought so. Okay. And her father was an Episcopal minister. I didn't know that. Okay, yes. Arthur, I think his name. And uh, my grandfather and her father had similar cousins. See, you bring something. Did not know so, that. Yep. Yeah. Virginia Seminary was where they both went. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Thank so. you. What do you think, Al? Pretty, pretty interesting. Which ones, what, which, how do they affect you? I think we all know they're telling us something we don't, we'd like to be reminded of. That's how I feel. <coughs> they had a big heart, wonderful personalities. <laughs> Because of that, people loved them. Yes, it was somehow very simple. Yes, Dave. Was the orphanage uh, recognized as a, a state institution at some point, and and was it phased out? Okay. Uh, as as you, you no, it was a Episcopal function. It was all within the Episcopal umbrella, but they had an issue. This is so 1960s. They said, you need a sprinkler system. And they had no money for a sprinkler system. It's just a classic change in, change in the times, but it was always under the Episcopal. You know what's funny? Anything up on the mountain <laughs> was called missionary work. <laughs> Anybody else? Any impressions, Sandy? Anybody? Which of these ladies seems to touch you the most? That would be hard to say because they're all extremely impressive individuals and um, you did a very good job of, of illuminating their stories. Yeah. You know what, you can, you, for listen, you can see the rhythm of every day. You know, Media Farm and, and Daisy Fritz, you know, yeah, okay. There should be a whole class that reminds us. Bill, do you have any thoughts? Bill? I would if I could unmute. <laughs> 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 I, I uh, ditto on what Sandy said. I think it's a great presentation. And uh, I certainly have been enlightened because they're uh, basically, folks, I have no awareness of whatsoever. So it was uh, very, very informative. Thank you very much. I, I was very happy to go from Stooky Richardson to Julie Davis Adams. I, and I'll tell you, I didn't tell you one thing about Julie Davis. At Brown versus Board of Education, I think there were several suits, but one of them about desegregating was involved South Carolina. The governor of South Carolina asked her father to make the argument against the Supreme Court for this for this segregation side. And it, this is like so hard. You know, you know, this is really tough for Julia, you know. And I she said, Why did you do it, Father? And he said, Well, he's a friend of mine. <laughs> Isn't that classic? He's a friend. But but I remember bringing it up to her. And she's so gracious. You could see the artist, art, the artist in her. I mentioned that to her, and you could just see this pain in her face. I was so naive, you know. Anyway, I didn't even mention any of that. Well, look at it's 1030, and here we are. Oh, Jim, I do have one, one thing. You Please. said there were two more classes. I think there's one. Is Maybe. this number five? This is five. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think it's still a good idea to try to figure this out. Okay. No, no, no. no. I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to just, it, to, next week, we're going to do James Ramsey and John Hall and, and a lot of depth. And then I'll truncate what I was going to do about the convention. That goes out, but I'll make the key point about that. 
and uh, and if we if we can get Patsy Klein in there, she's not <laughs> she's not from here, but all the gigs we have a map of every place she played. And if one thing, you remember on last point, I can hear Gracie Rowland was a good friend of mine. I called her Grandma Gracie, the one that was related to uh, uh, Daisy Fritz. Uh -huh. You know what she said about Patsy Klein? Everybody says this about Patsy Klein. Now we're going to do Rumsey Hall, really. Quick one on the Constitution, if we can get this in. But do you know what everyone says about Patsy Klein? This is by Gracie. I knew Patsy. Her relative was in the band. I knew Patsy. Patsy's a good girl. And you count to five. It's kind of wild, though. <laughs> they all do that. Thank you. We're done. So glad you're here. Thank, Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I appreciate you all being here because I've never been able to share this with anyone. Oh, okay. That's very good for us. Miss Violet and Miss Nina. One time, one time Nina invited like the Prime Minister of Canada for Sunday dinner. And, and she picked that week to have a man paper the wall who happened to be the town drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and so while the Prime Minister is there, the wallpaper is giving up. <laughs> That's what I got to do this. Miss Nina would always invite church congregations for Sunday, Sunday dinner. And Ben Schley told the story of uh, there was a day when the Lutheran minister is making his way. I bet you know these stories, Danny. They're all making their way like little geese up to, to Rose Bay because they know that they've been invited for Sunday dinner. And they all get there, knock on the door, and Nina, unfortunately, is very surprised. And they said, well, she said, why are you here? And usually Leon had to go, Leon Washington had to go out in the back and start killing chickens, you know. And he said, well, Miss Nina, you invited us for Sunday dinner. And she said, oh, well, you're a religious man. Feed the multitude. <laughs> Thank you.